Mental health, like physical health, is mental health. It's usually about depression, anxiety, and thoughts of suicide. Mental health, like physical health, is something we all have. When we talk about mental health, it's usually about depression, anxiety, and thoughts of suicide. But what's not said is that it affects us all. Think of her mind like a bottle of soda. Life shakes us up. And inside, the pressure builds. That pressure is looking for somewhere to go. And if we don't release it, it grows. It grows to the point where we can't enjoy the things we used to, we can't leave the house, or even get out of bed. We have to find moments to open up and release it. It can be as small as sitting still and taking a deep breath. When we talk to each other about what's bothering us, the cap comes off and pressure releases. Forget the stigma, all of us need to talk about our mental health. Start the conversation with hope for the day. We are in this together.
And welcome to another episode of Conversations Cafe live on April 30th. We're coming from wherever you happen to be recording or watching this. Uh, my pleasure to introduce you all to this episode titled Dual Diagnosis. I'm Carl Evans, the Senior Director of Operations at Hope for the Day and your host. And uh, if you've looked at the title, Dual Diagnosis, is actually a definition that typically means someone who is living with a diagnosed mental illness and usually has a connection with a substance abuse. But dual diagnosis has also been a term used in the mental health world to expand beyond just folks who are living with mental illness and a substance abuse, typically phrases a comorbidity. It's also used as a term when you hear dual diagnosis used for people who are experiencing a physiological illness while also experiencing a mental health challenge connected to it. And I bring that up because the very term dual diagnosis is somewhat controversial in the mental health world. And it's important for us to sort of, when we do conversations cafes, we like to talk about things in a frank and open way uh, and also look at the different facets around it. And tonight, it's no different. We have a great group of guests who are going to be sharing their intersectional experiences with what might be the very vast spectrum of potential dual diagnosis. Um, plus, we have a number of other guests here who joined from the Hope of the Day community. And as with every Conversations Cafe, we're never going to get the whole gamut of mental health, you know, knocked down in one episode but we always try to take small bites. And um, a lot of our conversations are, are based on Hope for the Day's proactive prevention plans and their programs and, and the vision to engineer conversations and bring education and outreach to someone before mental health adversely impacts our lives. I hope you enjoyed the opening video once we got it rocking and rolling. Um, the soda bottle is a central feature of Hope for the Day's educational theory. Uh, and it's really a way that we communicate understanding your mental health in layman's terms in the simplest ways possible so that we can bring this conversation, not just into a school zone or with experts, but to any community population out there. And another powerful way that Hope for the Day is able to do that when we talk about doing outreach is creating opportunities where we're normalizing the conversation. That's a central part of the proactive prevention vision. And perhaps Hope of the Day's strongest, most powerful tool in outreach and normalizing the conversation is something that we launched in May of 2018 called Sip of Hope Coffee Bar in the Logan Square neighborhood of Chicago. And it's become the sort of flagship of Hope of the Day's outreach programming. It's a place that achieves our three biggest goals. It provides a direct way to raise the visibility of resources and connect individuals with that information. It's a way to start the conversation. It's a way to connect individuals with education. And probably most importantly, it's a way of action, of activism. Um, Simple Hope is a platform in which individuals can connect and not just have a conversation inside of that space, but take it with them, take that conversation with them back out into their communities. And that's really the the finer designs of, of what Sip of Hope was designed to be, the, the highest aspirations is that this was going to be a beacon, not just a beacon of hope, but a beacon that connected communities in, a, in ways that are, are both very tangible and one-to-one, -one, but also in a sort of philosophical way as well. And unfortunately with the current realities around isolation and the way that our communities have had to batten down the hatches, um, Sip of Hope Coffee Bar was actually closed down in mid-March when Chicago and Illinois at large put in its isolation orders. And Sip of Hope has been a place that even though Hope for the Day controls it uh, as a, its parent company, Sip of Hope is its own autonomous sort of organization in that um, it has its own staff and its own management team. And they built the sort of very front line experience that's a sort of proxy of hope for the day. And 
that's an amazing team of baristas and management and people who generated a community in that floor space. And when we had to shut down, it was very easy for Hope of the Day to make certain very tough decisions, which was making sure that the staff was taken care of as best as possible. Um, also making sure that the financial obligations to vendors who, who bring resources and food and, and other services into Sip of Hope to make it be a functional coffee bar uh, were paid because almost 90% of, of Sip of Hope's vendors are local small businesses as well. And the fact is, is that as we continue to go into this isolation period, Sip of Hope is a business that is not able to generate revenue uh, and we need to recover that in order to open again. And hope of the day, along with all the people who've been connected and touched to Sip of Hope, not just hope of the day staff, have rallied together to launch a fundraising campaign, a GoFundMe that directly goes to support the capital finance for Sip of Hope to get operating again, to effectively pay its staff, meet its overhead obligations from utilities to vendors, and right now, if you are watching or are checking in with us or listening throughout the month of May, and you go to savesip.org, you too can help save Sip of Hope. Um, we've got a great video here that does a much better explanation than I could ever do justice from our founder, Johnny Boucher. Um, and let's get that playing right now. Hi, I'm Johnny. I'm the founder and CEO of Hope for the Day and Sip of Hope Coffee Bar. When we opened up Sip of Hope in May of 2018, we would have never known the impact that we would make and how many people we would connect to resources by simply starting the conversation around mental health with a cup of coffee. As we look forward to our two year anniversary, we could have also never predicted that we'd be shut down due to COVID-19. In honor of our anniversary, we are reopening our doors on Friday, May 1st, with limited hours and minimal operation to continue connecting you to resources in a time where they're needed most. But we're also asking for your help. Due to the lack of COVID-19 relief funding, we've launched this GoFundMe in order to responsibly reopen our doors when the stay-at-home orders are lifted. And we can't be another Chicago mental health resource that shuts its doors. So we are asking you, our community, to help us during these trying times and help save Sip of Hope. Join us at savesip.org. So that is puts everything into a nutshell. And again, we have been blown away by the support of the community. And when we talk about the Sip of Hope's community, that's not just Chicago or Illinois or the greater Midwest. We've had donors from across the country and outside of the United States. In fact, uh, in just the last 48 hours, we eclipsed nearly $30,000 uh, of the $60,000 goal with an unbelievable 503 donors. I just wanted to make sure I had the numbers right. Uh, and if you know anything about sort of crowdfunding, having 500 and plus donors, uh, you know, it does not matter the size, it's about the effort uh, to rally around this, whether you can give $5, $100, anything like that, that's not the point. The, the point is just making an effort and, and standing up and wanting to be an agent of impact. One of the best ways you could do this is just by sharing this information with your community and let other people know, you know, sharing the graphics, sharing the website, just let people know and help push in that conversation. Because at the end of the day, what Sip of Hope is really about is about connecting communities to a conversation that we need to have. Um, and so we don't want to go into much about that. This isn't a, uh, this Conversations Cafe is not a, 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 tele, a telethon for that. But um, if you have the time and energy, do some more research and check out savesip.org. Um, and let's build on from that. So with dual diagnosis as our central topic today, we also have a feature that we've been running throughout April, celebrating um, because a week or so ago, it was National Volunteer Week or Honoring Volunteers. And Hope of the Day is an organization that is founded by Johnny Boucher, but it proliferates through a vast, diverse community 
of people, not just in-house staff, but volunteers and surrogates who step up and donate their time and their voices to make an impact in their community in different ways. And there's all sorts of different avenues that you can take to make your mark in your community, to bring this conversation into your space. And we have two awesome guests with us today who have stepped up to the plate and made a, their own marks. So we wanna make sure we can hear and see them, um, but our two featured agents of impact for today is going to be Marlo and Hillary. Let me make sure we can see Marlo and Hillary. So we're gonna do a little unmute and start that video. Uh, Marlo, Hillary, can we see you? Can we hear you? Hi. Hi, Marlo. Hi. Hi, Hillary. Hey, how are you? Great. Uh, so thank you so much for joining us. And, you know, let's sort of jump right into it with, um, let's start with Hillary. How did you, you know, get involved? You know, first name, last name, where are you, the general area you're from and all that good stuff. Let, let the people know. Yeah. So hello, everyone. I'm Hillary Kniss. Um, I'm from Chicago. I uh, grew up in the suburbs, but living in the city now. Um, I first heard of Hope for the Day through one of my good friends who happens to be a bandmate of somebody who works there. Um, she knew my past um, suicide history. She knew my past uh, passion for mental health. So she was suggesting that it would be a really good idea for me to get involved with them. And so I kind of took some time, started following the social media stuff, um, started going to the education seminars, um, I got to meet both you, Carl, um, and Mike Manopel through those educations. And so everybody I was meeting was just super awesome in those. And I really loved the concept that it was starting with conversations. Um, and it was about being proactive in the suicide uh, prevention step. So it was just very cool. And then when the opportunity came to get involved, I'm like, yeah, sign me up because I want to help more people. Thank you so much, Hillary. Uh, and again, thank you for joining us and sharing a little bit about yourself. And Marlo. Um, well, I'm Marlo Reyes. I am from Mexico originally. I've been living in Chicago for about almost four years, which has gone so fast. Um, and I first saw her for the day at Warp Tour in like, I want to say 2018. It was like a really, really rough time for me. I had just gotten diagnosed for the first time with um, depression, wrong. I'm actually bipolar, but it was like my start of like learning about my mental health and finding hope for the day was really um, helpful for me because I didn't really, coming from Mexico where it's like so closed um, minded when it comes to mental health, it was just so nice to like see a community of people that were fighting um, through conversation to really make a difference. So it was, um, it took me a while to really kind of get in touch and I'm a very shy person. So it took me a while to actually create like a relationship with um, everyone at Hope for the Day, but it, it has been one of the best experiences since I moved to Chicago, honestly. And that's fantastic. And I wanna, I wanna sort of draw, you know, people who are watching and listening now or in, uh, in the future to some really important things about both your efforts, you know, two different sort of intersectional experiences in that uh, we were connected. We started, our organization started first with outreach in music scenes. You know, that was Johnny's community and we've grown to meet people in other spaces. And that's been people taking us into other spaces. And I'd love to know sort of what has been the nature of your outreach work um, in the general Chicago area and anywhere else, there's a lot of different ways you can get involved. Sometimes people are opening the doors and bringing education into the space. Sometimes folks are helping put a flag in the ground somewhere and raising the visibility of resources. And so uh, let's start with Marla, what, what, is, what has been the sort of general nature of your volunteering? Um, so I mostly have done um, concerts. So in Mexico, I was in, in bands and I was a vocalist. So just that like getting back in touch with music was also like a really nice part of um, getting involved with Hope for a Day. So I mostly have done that. I've also um, kind of been in the 
events that have been happening like in the south side because that's where I live and it has more of a connection with like the Latino community so that has also been like um, part of what I've been doing um, and hopefully they inspired me to create a podcast in Spanish um, also about mental health we're actually opening up to more just stigmatized um, subjects in general but it started only as mental health and that's mostly like how I've been um, doing that. <laughs> Perfect. We're going to talk a little bit more about that in a second. And Hillary, what's what's your outreach action? Yeah, so uh, like Marlo, I've done a lot of the concerts. The Live Nation connection has been really cool because it just kind of brings people to a common platform. And I don't know that they're necessarily expecting to see us there, but I think everybody can kind of resonate with that message that they see often in big letters saying it's okay to not be okay. Um, so you get a lot of conversations going there, which I love. Um, and I also got to participate in the Hope Ball and watching Johnny Boucher try and be an auctioneer is quite an amazing experience. So, and thank you for sharing that. And one of the things that I hope everyone sort of engaging with us right now or in later days can, can appreciate is that um, folks will say, how can I get involved? How can I get involved? And well, live events here in the greater Chicagoland area is, is probably one way. Finding that accessibility has been something that we've been happy to help create opportunities in, in other places. So music venues, no matter whether we go into schools or businesses or other places like that, the, the, the scene that is music, and when I say the scene that is music, it doesn't matter the genre, okay? I don't care whether it's pop, punk, metal, country, hip hop, okay, polka, it doesn't matter if that's a place that you connect with. Um, we can help raise the visibility of resources there. Every place is a place to be talking about mental health. And sometimes it can be hard for people to visualize, well, how, do, how can I get involved? You do not need to be a clinician to get involved. And that leads me into sort of, I'm gonna circle back to some things that you talked about earlier. Um, one thing that we know when we created a, a volunteer outlet was, we wanna make sure that we're not putting people in irresponsible positions. They're not, you know, you start talking about mental health and suicide prevention and things like that. You're not setting yourself up to be an on the spot clinician. You're not setting yourself up to be a lifeline or first responder kind of person, but what can you do? And one of the most amazing things that I've found about our agents of impact is how many people are coming from lived experience and are driven to want to reach out. Um, I obviously, you know, talked about in, in previous recordings about my own lived experience, but it's such an internal experience for us when we're experiencing a mental challenge that it might be surprising for people to hear that someone who's living with a mental health challenge would want to sort of put themselves out there or that it could be taxing. And, um, let's start, we'll go from Hillary back to Marlo, but Hillary, you know, sort of from where you touched off on, what sort of made you feel comfortable or compelled you, you know, what value did you find out of doing outreach? You know, just when you've lived through personal um, traumatic mental health situations yourself, you, you don't want anybody else to have to go through that. So if you can offer a little assistance in helping ease somebody's personal situation, like I don't know anybody who wouldn't want to help stop somebody else from going through what they personally have gone through. Now, I want to talk about something here with that one of the things that we will hear from people because stigma sort of rules everything around mental health and one of the ways stigma can keep us silent is that is lack of understanding um and there can be a, a totally innocent sense of stigma that you can't be an advocate for mental health if you've been impacted negatively you know because we see clinicians and they present themselves you know rightly or wrongly sort of like that they've got it all together um, and that's important for their professional level. But when you're an advocate, sometimes folks say, well, if you, you know, if you found yourself sort of hit hard by something, is it appropriate for you to sort of tell other people like there's hope out there? You know, and so I wonder for you, did you sort of question getting involved with us? Or was it kind of like, you know, this, this was something that felt like you had to do it? For me personally, it was actually something that made me want to be more a part of it because I saw the realness of the people that were presenting and providing the education. Um, many of the staff have been through their own experiences. And again, just to be able to relate to that person, they have that experience of going through it. And so to me, it made it even better. 
That's beautiful. And I want to piggyback that to Marlo. Um, and you, you know, when you were talking about you had your first diagnosis and you found a, got a corrective diagnosis, really the same to you, sort of, you know, where were you, where were you in your journey when you first connected with us? And was there a, was there a distance between first seeing that hopefully the day existed and you deciding I want to do something? Was it a week? Was it an hour? Was it years? What was it for you? For me, it was months. Um, when I first met or saw hope of, of know, my brain is just not Englishing today, <laughs> but <laughs> my, the first time I met you guys, um, I was on antidepressants that were killing me because if I've discovered anything is antidepressants and bipolar disorder just don't get along very well. And so I was very off all the time. And finally, when I got out of that and got myself a little bit more put together, that's when I decided to reach out and really like look at because I my friend got me a sweatshirt it rained that day at the concert and he got me a sweatshirt and finally I went oh it has a website on there I should check out what more they do and what else is going on so since then it's it's started I guess and again to further drive home some important things there is that you wherever your mental health journey is, if you're engaged in this right now, this isn't about you get to a perfect place and then you're ready to help. Sometimes as part of the journey of taking control of your life and finding what works for you, turning your energies to supporting others can be a way of, of supporting yourself, um, learning things about yourself. And I would like to know, as you've been through these processes, you know, I'll start with Marlo. Um, one thing that we're always talking about is you have to meet people where they are and not where you expect them to be. And when we talk about stigma, cultural hindrances is probably one of the most consistent factors. Uh, stigma comes to us through the language of gender and ethnicity and geography and economics and everything. And you've already sort of touched on this. So what's something that you've learned about as you've gotten comfortable, you know, advocating this conversation? What was something that maybe you learned about and your cultural background, did that play into it at all? You know? So I, I've i learned so much um, since I started with uh, Hope for a Day. And one of the big things for me was how it gave me, it made me realize that I still had a purpose as a person. And it made me realize that my struggles that I've lived with and all of the really bad experiences that I had um, the past few years, they happened for a reason and they happened so I could, or not, maybe not happen for a reason, but that I could use that experience to help someone else and to give it a, like a reason, you know, like those movies when someone dies and they're like, you can't let them die in like vain. That was how I felt like, I can't let this bad things that happen in my life be in vain. And it kind of helped me like get that drive. And it did also like when I started the podcast and when I started just kind of trying to move it more into like my Latino and my Spanish speaking community, it was because in my family and many people after I got diagnosed, they were just like, that doesn't exist. Depression doesn't exist. You can't, no, that's not real. So it really drove me to be like, I need to use this experience to talk about it and get more people engaged in this and really find this community. And just as a follow-up to that, Marlo, before uh, we go over to Hillary, how has the podcast been? going so tough we have been in a pause for a couple of um for a couple of weeks no months at this point just i i feel like i've had conversations with a lot of people that i know that don't want to be a part of it because they're not ready yet and i completely understand that because we shouldn't push anyone right and i always say that podcasts like that are people some people need to scream in order for some other people to be able to even whisper what they're going through and my podcast i feel like it has uh, paused because there's such a stigma that people don't want to talk about it. They can't, like they can't bring themselves to have a conversation that is going to be recorded. And then people that they know and that don't really understand those struggles are going to judge them for it. And it's been that like really big struggle because the reason is what, like it kind of circles around and makes it really difficult to work with that. Oh, thank you. <laughs> 
I'm actually sporting the new logo that's gonna start um, once yeah, yeah. I get things figured out <laughs> with the podcast. But yeah. And uh, I want to just circle back to that quote. Uh, we gotta scream in order for people to whisper. We're gonna put that up. I'm gonna. We're gonna have to come up with like. I'm gonna need like a like a hot quotes board. But I, you know, as we continue, I'll write to, it down and email it to you. Yeah. <laughs> so you as we get it. this whole like live stream thing going, I'm gonna. I'll dress up my background a little bit more. Um, and so, with that, so Hillary. What's been, you know, from one of the, the things that we've learned with our Ages of Impact program is it's grown and grown and grown, and, and that's what we call our volunteer system. Um, we find that folks bring their own stories and then find their own sort of motivations and passions for it. And I'd really like to know the same thing what we asked Marlon. What's sort of, what's been something that's sort of been illuminating that you've learned? as you've been through this, as you've gotten more and more involved with us? Um, a lot of it is just how many people are truly affected by it. Like a lot of times when you're going through a situation because of all the stigma, you think you're alone. Um, but seriously, if you go to one of those concerts and sit at the um, table <laughs> where we <laughs> have the tent and everything, the number of people that will come up to you, whether to say, I myself suffer, whether to say, I know somebody who suffers or would say, I wanna help, it's mind blowing. Like I didn't have any expect, or I didn't expect to talk to that many people, but it's really true. There's no one type of person that it affects, it affects everyone. And so just being able to have something as simple as a conversation to help ease people's situation is, awesome because people, again, with the stigma, they don't want to talk to people. They don't want to have a diagnosis. They don't want to go see a doctor or, oh, I have to go to therapy. But just saying, hey, how you doing today is a great place to start for people. That's perfect. And I think um, just hearing that, again, you know, one of the things as we close down this part of the, the, the episode is just where we start the the volunteer journey with hope for the day is going to look different for some people it's they take some resource cards and they just hand it among their friends and we've heard you know and it's across different ages 12 years old 88 years old and they say I just can i do some with some wristbands and some resource cards and you may think that's dismissive if you're out there and you hear that i mean well that's not that big a deal but that really, really, really is a big deal. It's a way of, ooh, watch this. It's a way of sort of shouting out there to help people whisper in the background. I'm, I'm, yeah. gonna, I'm gonna smooth it out. <laughs> it's, Marlo, it's Marlo's quote, but. Um, it definitely needs a little work in there. <laughs> yeah, but in each one of your ways, you know, where you started and how you continue to grow, even if it's becoming sort of a, a lead, a tent leader, right? Someone who's comfortable showing the new individuals who come in and want to join outreach. If it's expanding beyond outreach, things that you're used to and trying to do something autonomous in your community based on this. Uh, this is how we actually make an impact. Why we call it Agents of Impact is because we don't get this done with one big flashy billboard or one big flashy commercial or something like that. This is grassroots and it's people sort of taking agency for themselves and finding a way to press this conversation. And um, I think it's really important for those who are watching and listening now or in, in future time, you know, to, to celebrate and, and be, have a big hats off to folks like Hillary and Marlo who are shining examples of what you can do and what you can do in your community, whether you're here in the greater Chicagoland area or in any, any corner of the globe in which Hope for the Day's work has been able to, to reach out and connect. So Hillary and Marlo, thank you so much for joining us. And if y'all feel comfortable, I'd like y'all to stay on, you know, keep a, keep us company as we go over to our next group of guests. Let's so, give them a good old fashioned beer, 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 beer. Beer, 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 beer. I don't have my sound. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for having us on. Yeah, thank, you, thank you so much. Thank you, Marlo. Uh, and with that, we're now moving over into the central arc of of the theme for Conversations Cafe today. Dual diagnosis, as I talked about right at the start, 
the traditional definition was someone who has a diagnosable mental illness in conjunction with a substance abuse disorder. And why I bring that up is because stigma being the running theme through all of our conversations impacts and shapes the way that we approach, think about, and respond to mental health, both institutionally as a community and personally. And well, dual diagnosis is actually kind of a stigmatizing structure because one, substance abuse and mental health don't have to be compartmentalized. They don't have to be separate. Someone could be using and finding themselves connected or leading down a road into addiction because they're running away from mental challenges or trying to cope with or treat or self-medicate for mental challenges. Moreover, when we talk about the idea that mental illness is a thing and then there's other things that can be happening to your body, those aren't separate. Anything that impacts your quality of life, and this is strictly Hope for the Day's assertion. No, I don't think this is gonna be the DSM-5 yet, hopefully, or yet anyway. But anytime something impacts your quality of life, that's your mental health. And we kind of reappropriate the term dual diagnosis because if there's something that becomes a diagnosis about a malady with your body, toothache, cancer, a broken leg, anything that impacts your quality of life is automatically going to dramatically impact your mental health. That's one of the reasons that we don't necessarily need to give a checklist about mental health and living with you know the, the current pandemic. One of the realities is if you look at a lot of government responses, they talked about financial support, important. They talked about staying safe, wash your hands, important. Uh, and then they get to mental health a few weeks later. But we're all impacted by our current realities, but we were always impacted by our mental health long before we've been united in this, this, this current issue. So dual diagnosis is what we're gonna be focusing on uh, and it's told through stories of four individuals um, who are going to be sharing their relationships and connections with them. And the first folks I'm going to bring on is someone who you've already actually heard and seen his handy hands at work. Um, and that's Aaron Dunbar and Mike Vinopal. Mike Vinopal is education lead for Hope of the Day. And Aaron Dunbar is a spectacularly wonderful human being, talented in many ways. Let's make sure we can hear them and see them. Hi. Hi. So, you hip cats, please introduce yourselves. Well, ladies first. Uh, I'm Erin Dunbar. I work at Sip of Hope Coffee Bar. And she's lovely at the coffee and the community and being supported. So, uh, I happen to be uh, her partner, her betrothed, uh, and the education director at Hope for the Day. My name is Mike Van Opel. Um, and I'm also a musician in uh, Chicago and elsewhere, just trying to keep myself well um, with that self-expression, you know? Well, welcome, welcome, welcome. And let's just dive right into it. When we talked about the dual diagnosis, you know, I sort of teed it up, but from your point of view and from your, your perspective, what does that mean for all y'all? All y'all. Oh, yeah. Well, for me, <clears throat> Uh, I, I live with a diagnosis of bipolar disorder that I didn't receive until I was 31, um, after shit hit the fan. And we, we, as a family and a community did what, uh, most people do, um, because we don't normalize conversations about mental health. We, you know, we're like, oh, damn, things are bad. Let's get some help. Um, inpatient hospitalization gets you stable, but it doesn't like fix everything. So the the uh the hard part is like figuring out once you're stable uh what next and like sometimes that can feel very daunting like trying to rebuild yourself when you've like your ego has literally been shattered by uh the the challenge of it all and the, and the thoughts or whatever the feelings or the situations that you got you got into at that crisis stage so um for me it's constantly just battling to stay well and to uh, apply everything I've learned um, because right now like it's, it's hard I can I can get myself uh, all worked up and into a pretty negative place if I allow a negative thought train to like gather ahead of steam it, like it builds momentum and pulls me down and uh, so it's important for me to stay on top of different uh, 
trade trains of thought like that and just knock them out like with something make something do something or do nothing and try to feel better and uh i've been looking at my wristband a whole lot uh reminding myself to practice what i preach and that it's okay if i'm feeling sad and grieving experiences i'm missing or um or frustrated or overwhelmed by um the uncertainties and stuff like that because i think everybody's feeling that way um but other than that i'd say ultimately i'm very grateful for my physical health um uh being what it is and you know i sure i could exercise more and uh you know lose a little bit of my joe that's what i call my belly my joe but uh hey you know working on it what about you uh, so I, what I have had, have had, uh, depression and anxiety since I was a kid, uh, no nothing existed at the time to talk about that. So it wasn't even, you know, a possibility until I was in my twenties that that could have been what it was. Um, and then in my late twenties, I was diagnosed with hypothyroidism, which is very common. Um, I apparently 3 million people a year in the U S are diagnosed with it. Um, but it has, Three a, million? Uh, yeah. So, yeah. uh, it has a lot of symptoms that are similar to anxiety and depression. Um, and so a lot of it is kind of like, a lot of the time I just feel like I don't know what's causing the way that I'm feeling. So I'm, I'm confused a lot or, you know, I'm confused by what I'm feeling, not knowing where it's coming from. Um, so that's kind of my dual, one of my dual diagnoses. And as a caregiver, like sometimes I want to be able to attribute it to one or the other, like, and I'm learning to be able to, you know, it doesn't fucking matter. She doesn't feel very good right now. I'm just going to sit with her or I'm going to try my best to not try and be a fixer because that's sometimes not what she needs, uh, you know, so. Thank you for sharing that, Mike and Aaron. And, and Aaron, so what, um, what, what is as best as you would, you would feel comfortable answering it? What is a, just the sort of layman's definition of hypothyroid? So Hypo it's an under active, yeah. <laughs> It's an underactive thyroid, so it causes like um, just your body to like be dysregulated. What is the thyroid? Well, it's a little, it's a little hormone, hormone maker. It's sac a gland, in, right? A gland in yeah. your neck. It's butterfly shaped. So anyway, uh, yeah. So it. A lot of my symptoms have to do with like fatigue or anxiety or just like feeling out of it. Um, one of my, one of my symptoms that I'm noticing the most lately is memory. So I like just can't remember something like someone's name or the name of a movie or something. Um, and just like foggy headed, which is stuff that can be, you know, attributed to, uh, anxiety and depression also. Uh, and also hypothyroidism causes anxiety and depression. Um, I think before I had hypothyroidism, I'm pretty sure that I had both of those things before, but yeah. And thank you for, for sharing that because it's important for us, for, for folks to understand. Um, this is a perfect example of when we talk about dual diagnosis, uh, mental health linked issues will fall into the same compendium, but someone who's going through something like in the generic sense, thyroid issues, because there's a few different things that could happen to your glands. You would work with medical practitioners, you would work with experts and, and things like that, and they'll go through any sort of batteries of tests. And if they come up with, well, there's, there's something that's wrong, you're gonna work with medical professionals on strategies and solutions and treatments and whatever the, the course of action needs to be and throughout that whole process, the thought of bringing in a mental health professional in the traditional, the traditional history of how we treat medicine, that would not necessarily be a part of it. Yeah. 
And the not knowing of what you're going through, right? Uh, the physical experience can be a stress and a pressure build on your soda bottle in and of itself. You, as it so happens, also have a very specific experience that does directly impact the your thoughts, feelings, and emotions. The, what is readily accepted in the old or traditional world of as the mental health spectrum, right? So it's very unique, and I, and I think it's important for people to understand. Uh, you know, thyroid. You brought up three million uh, diagnoses a year, and thyroid issues glandular issues, if you want to shrink it down to like, or just still to keep it really simple for folks, is a place in which, long story short, we're talking about chemical productions. And if anyone listening or watching this right now or later has ever heard of chemical imbalances, there's a lot of different things that can lead to that. But the thyroid is a place that you could be thinking you're sitting in a mental health pocket, you've got mental health issues, and it might actually be a gland disruption, a direct thing. Vice versa, you might think you've got a gland issue <laughs> going on because you grew up in a house or an environment where mental health wasn't constantly talked about. And thinking it's a gland issue could actually be covering up the fact that maybe there's a mental health discussion. So what was, can you share with me, if you feel comfortable, Aaron, what was the discovery process for that? You know, when did, when did I need to go to the doctor come into play? You know, how did you approach it as a, if you feel comfortable talking about that end. Yeah, I I actually distinctly remember this time that I said to Mike, well, okay. So for one, my mom um, has hypothyroidism too. And it is something that can be genetically passed down. So she had said something about that. She used to be a nurse. So she had said something about that at some point. So um, it was in my head a little bit and I was feeling absolutely exhausted. Like I could not go through a work day without having to like take several breaks or, you know, on my break, I would like take a nap, um, just absolute exhaustion. So I remember specifically I saying something to Mike, like, I think, I think it's my thyroid, you know, and, and I, I don't even know I, you know, I don't even know really why. And I was but... like, what's a thyroid? <laughs> so, <laughs> um, yeah, so I ended up going to the doctor and then, and then they do a blood test and yeah. Um, but but it was, it's... it was the fact that it was me realizing that not everybody is exhausted all the time and like, can't keep themselves <laughs> awake or like, feel like one of my biggest things is that I feel like I'm underwater like I feel so weird in yeah. my head and, and I'll be like are you okay like I'll notice she's off and I'll be worried and sometimes she can't articulate it and uh you know I'm not a professional either so but now that like she's explained it to me and you know it doesn't really matter if it's the thyroid or if it's just her depression's really like dragging her down that particular day I think it's also worth, you know, acknowledging that it hasn't been like, hey, all right, now we know what it is. We're fixed. It's like constantly trying to figure out, well, is there more we can do? Because I still don't feel all that fucking great. Yeah. Like, and then and then I'll write and I'll like do research on the Internet and I'll be like, why aren't my doctors doing this thing that they <laughs> that the Internet says? And then you bring that up to them and you're kind of like you kind of gaslight yourself in that you're like, oh no, it's fine. It's just my depression. Oh no, it's, it's fine. I have the medication to fix the thyroid thing now. And you're constantly like pushing and pulling with yourself, or at least I am. Yeah. So that's, and that's, you know, again, thank you for being so open about this, both of you for that relationship of navigating this, because it's important for people to sort of take note um, you touched on one of my favorite words I bring up about gaslighting and, and, and taking our, another thing stigma does is it makes us have to, it creates the illusion of hierarchy about mental health challenges. And what that means is stigma can also make us feel that we are supposed to measure ourselves and compare our experience outwardly to match up and say, well, you know, 
I look at other people around me and they're doing this or not doing this. Uh, I Google something and I am like this or not like this. And that makes us decide when to validate our experiences. And one of the hardest things to do mental health overall is to embrace if it hurts you, if it impacts you, if it disrupts your quality of life, that's all the validation you need to progress further to looking for support. It's very, 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 very consistent that people will know the thing or something is wrong, but won't progress towards action because they build up any number of things to make them pause, to not reach out. Even if it's just they feel silly talking to a, a primary care physician or someone they're connected to, be a family member, a spouse, et cetera. That's a very consistent story. Um, what I'd like to do before we, we bring in our other guests and sort of expand this conversation is you, you touched on it a little bit already as you've gone through this, um, because our next guests are going to have a, 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 a very different sort of intersection on, on the spectrum of dual diagnosis. Has the conversation with your peers and your community members all tying your family? You talked about you knew your mom had hypothyroidism. And one of the most powerful things that we can be doing to change the reality of how we approach mental health is starting conversations with our family, mm -hmm. learning the lineage, because that can be an impossible, you know, if we remember or listen to sort of some of the things like for instance, Marlo brought up earlier with the, with the family, the family connection, there can be obstacles. So for you, as we move forward, did you have any, challenges in, okay, here's a diagnosis and communicating that outwardly to others around you? Uh, yeah, I think, I don't, uh... I think it's been different, way different for you than most people. Yeah. For me, For me, I don't know why, but bipolar disorder seems to carry this, like, this, like, kind of extra heavy stigma. Like, people are like, oh, you're, you're, you're a, kind of a nut you know you're you're uh and you know i grew up not understanding mental health and but very much understanding that i was different and that people kind of perceived me to be kind of a, a silly weird uh eccentric but real nice dude you know like nobody was malicious about things but sometimes it was like you know People made me feel like an outcast, essentially, is what it comes down to. So having the name for it and then being able to be educated on about, like, the disorder and what it comes with, well, now, like, I can own it. I can be like, bipolar disorder does not define me. Like, I know I, I can, you know, do things to smash it in the face and, like, you know, make it my bitch, you know, like, I, but, you know, that's, that's not nice. That, that's. But you know what I mean? Um, I like to feel strong and aware of what I'm facing. So I, like you can't talk about a solution before you talk about a problem. So to know the problem was helpful in me coming up with my own solutions and understanding what I had already been doing as like a survival instinct and uh, understanding to do it more deliberately. Like for instance, self-medication with cannabis. Like that could have been very you know, bad for me growing up. But it, as, a, as it turned out, I think it, it helped me to feel okay most of the time and conceal the most uh, significant impacts my mental health was having until, you know, eventually that Band-Aid just wasn't enough. And, um, you know, my soda bottle was about to, you know, explode all over everybody. So um, for me, Talk, which, it, which it did well and it did and then uh, but but being it. able to talk about it, it uh post-crisis like i did my inpatient stay i received a diagnosis i went home to live with my folks while my apartment stayed empty uh and trashed uh until everybody felt comfortable with my safety and i love my people for just stepping in um at that time because you know my mind was just all over the place and I could have potentially harmed myself and they did exactly what they were supposed to do. 
in that type of scenario where I was talking about things that were clearly, uh, you know, part of a delusion that I was uh, kind of trapping myself in. And, uh, you know, so ultimately getting to that place gave me additional tools, but it also gave me this more keen awareness of the stigma that comes with a diagnosis like bipolar disorder. So um, that's why I like to tell people, you know, because for the most part, people can look at um, the things I'm doing in, in the field with our education and be like, okay, well, it's okay to struggle and it's okay to have a diagnosis and it's okay to talk about mental health. And if I talk about mental health, then I could help people actually feel more open to express when their problems are smaller and more manageable uh, prior to a crisis kind of level of impact. So um, that's been that's been kind of my experience telling my family. And then as a domino effect, they all rallied around the mission. They rallied around hope for the day and sip of hope and most of the baristas at SIP would be, tell you that I've got aunts and uncles and people from California and everywhere else coming in being like, my, my, my nephew or my whatever, Mike uh, and his, his lovely fiance, uh, this is the family business, we'll support you to the end of the earth, you know, and uh, talking more openly about their own struggles, even, even though it's like retrospect. Um, I feel like it's moving towards being able to talk about our mental health in real time, you know, rather than, okay, it's been like a month since I felt like total darkness consuming me. And now I'm going to tell everybody, oh, it was, it was pretty rough a month ago, but I, I made my way out of it. Like, that's my, my hope is that my family, my friends, my coworkers will be able to, instead of waiting a month when they get out of it tell me about it when they're in it and be like, dude, shit's dark right now. Can we talk, you know? And I know that people are doing that. Um, and it's a blessing and a curse when you open yourself up in a way, because people are like, Oh, I can talk to you. And, you know, it can be a lot sometimes, but, um, you know, it's just so much better to know that people are talking than, uh, keeping it all to themselves. I'm, I'm willing to, uh, you know, always talk. Yeah. Yeah. And I, for me, um, my, my mom is pretty open about stuff. Uh, it's, it's, yeah, it's an interesting situation, but, uh, in with my family, but they're pretty, they're pretty open about like all, all of those things. So it is a little bit different in my case. Um, I mean, you've talked to your mom directly about experiences of depression where, where she's like, she's almost guilted herself about not doing more for you. Right. Yeah. But, she was um, like really guilty for a long time. Um, but when it comes to my family and my friends, yeah, just like being more open about it personally too. And just saying like, just sharing that you might know what that feels like or that you have experienced something similar or if they do need to talk that they can talk to you is really like opens people up. Um, her, her parents, uh, definitely way more West coast than my Midwestern parents. So when they got to meet together, it was really cool because my parents have kind of lightened up over the years, but, um, her mom grew up like in San Francisco during the sixties and like hung out with the beats and her dad lived all over the fucking world because his, his, uh, you know, his family, was involved in some some government stuff and like lived in Kenya and Afghanistan and Chile like they had a completely different background and life experience to draw upon than my parents um and that's not better that's not worse there's no hierarchy right it's it's spectrum um people's experiences are what they are and uh so her parents are real cool because they're very open and very honest about feelings and emotions and um even her mom just being being able to talk about it recently about like how she she sometimes will just feel like she, she's uh she can't control her her tears you know just because it, it it's it's a, a lot right now for her and uh it's just nice to be on the phone with them and be feely you know what i mean 
<laughs> yeah. And that's a great point to bring up, you know, as, as, as we sort of, we're going to bring in our next guest here. I think the thing, one of the things to take away that you touched on there is with parents hearing and learning about a thing and really anyone who's supportive in our community, in, in our network, whoever that's going to be, but especially when it's parents, if they start to learn as we're learning about our own mental health, the blame game can be something that can come in there. And that's something that I think we're going to circle back to as we go into the larger group. Um, obviously, because you know, Marlo had touched on her experience with, with bipolar and, and Hillary had shared some things. So we're going to circle in um, on the mental health side for sure uh, with the whole group. Um, so again, thank you so much for sharing uh, we love a little you. bit of a focus. And our next guests are going to share from their intersectional level here. Uh, we have the phenomenal Amanda and Rick joining us. And I want to make sure we can see and hear them. Amanda and Rick. Hello. Hello. Where are you? There you are. I'm sorry. I, was, I didn't realize we were going to do a screen share there. <laughs> OK. Let me show them Amanda's pretty screen share. She looks nice. Come on, let me do it. We're all it. beautiful people, I suppose. Check it out. Yeah, there it is. Heartfelt beginnings. So in let's, the house. let's dive right into it. Please, Amanda and Rick, uh, reintroduce yourselves. This would be Rick reintroducing yourself, but Amanda, introduce yourselves to the Hope of the Day audience for the first time. Um, Rick Osowski, I am a part of the programming team with Mike and Carl for all we do with Conversations Cafe. Uh, I also am the founder and host of Anthologies of Hope, the audio podcast that you may have heard for some of the uh, uh, Conversations Cafes that have gone out. Um, and it's uh, great to be back here for you know what we're doing now weekly instead of what we were doing monthly. Um, and uh, I'll let Amanda intro herself and then we'll get into it. Hi, I'm Amanda. Um, I'm Rick's wife. <laughs> uh, I have been involved with Hope Today probably close to as long as he has, um, just not quite as active. Um, I now um, not only have sort of worked through my own mental health journey, um, I live with Crohn's disease. I struggle with infertility and I'm now, we're now the parents to an almost one year old. Um, and I started working as an infertility antenatal and postpartum doula um, about six months ago. And so uh, all of that has become virtual in the most recent time, but um, just offering support to people wherever they're at in their journey to parenthood. Well, thank you, Amanda and Rick, for joining us. You know, in a lot of ways with a lot of our different partners in prevention, um, dual diagnosis is, is, is a topic that we constantly revisit, but in a lot of ways, to be perfectly frank, this episode is largely inspired by Amanda and Rick um, in that, you know, all the different facets and, you know, the, 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 the theology of parenthood, okay, um, and all of the industry and the money and the cultural directions and the prejudices and the good things and the happy things and, 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 the, and all the things that are around family and being parent and being mother and father and everything in there. And I'm gonna zero in on the mother side for a second, uh, with all due respect, Rick. Um, with all of that around there, it's almost consistently shocking to me how little love and attention is given to the mental health reality. And, and I come to that approach from seeing the sort of delayed conversation uh, around postpartum uh, the delayed conversations around conception struggles and challenges that, that come along with that. You know, from stand-up comedians to, to successful best-selling books is the story of like, you know, going through the nine months and the X amount of weeks and all the jokes about the pains and the da 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 da, -da. but not enough of an actual conversation about the mental health impact um, through the whole thing. And so, you know, we were so hyped to have you on, uh, so just sort of like talk, you know, there's, there's a lot of different ways to come at this. And I kind of just want to let you sort of free, free riff it a little bit about just how, you know, how did the mental health conversation sort of pop up, intersect, you know, confront both of you throughout 
all of it. <laughs> you know, and you included Crohn's in there as well, too. Sorry. Yeah, Excuse absolutely. So there's one thing I just want to clarify. Um, you mentioned postpartum, but I just want to be mindful of language. So every person who gives birth goes through the postpartum period. That's postpartum is literally just the time after you give birth. Um, postpartum depression, postpartum anxiety, postpartum OCD, those are mental illnesses. And they're now, um, they're categorized together, together as perinatal mood and anxiety disorders or PMADs. So the term postpartum is not a mental health term. It's actually just related to the physical period of time after one gives birth. Um, so I just wanted to clarify that just so we're all um, using the right words. But um, I think that's a really good question. So living um, with Crohn's disease, I started having symptoms um, back in 2009. I was 23 years old and it took me six and a half years to get diagnosed because um, the standard testing didn't show what it needed to show. And I was told by a lot of doctors and in a lot of hospitals that it was all in my head or that, you know, I was making things up. I was looking for attention. I was uh, using, un, you know, unhealthy coping mechanisms for my stress. And that played a huge part in my mental health and just kind of feeling really hopeless that um, I was never going to feel better. No one was ever going to believe me. There was no light at the end of the tunnel. And that was sort of the crux of my mental health challenges. I spent 14 weeks in an IOP program in 2013 to 2014. Um, and kind of when I came out of that, long story short, met Rick because of that program. And we have, have since the day that we met, have been, you know, huge mental health advocates, both for our own journeys and the way that our lives have been affected by suicide. And when we, when I was diagnosed with Crohn's, um, Crohn's disease is a gastrointestinal disorder that can affect um, sort of anything from your mouth to your behind in, in terms of your GI tract. And it's not really very pleasant to talk about. It's kind of an embarrassing disease. And so there's a lot of stigma around it. And I started um, advocacy for that as soon as I kind of had my own footing under me, um, sharing my story because I felt like, you know, there were other people that could relate. And when Rick and I started trying to conceive, um, you know, we really had no idea what it was going to be like. Like we now joke that we spent a lot of money on condoms we never needed to. But um, you know, we tried to get pregnant for almost a year naturally, and we met with a doctor. And when we started going through testing and then infertility treatments, I was shocked at the stigma surrounding infertility. Um, you know, as a woman, um, it's sort of thought that my body was put on this earth to carry another, um, to birth and, and feed a baby. And when I felt like I couldn't do that, it felt, you know, kind of shameful. Um, and our families, you know, everyone was asking us when we were going to have a baby, when we were going to start our family, what were we waiting for? We weren't getting any younger. Um, and so when Rick and I started infertility treatment, we sat down together and decided that we wanted to be really open about our story, which meant, you know, for us sharing it on social media, writing, um, you know, in sort of intimate details about the fertility experience. And um, our families were very surprised and not quite comfortable with those choices at first. Um, they felt like those were things that should just go on behind closed doors. But much like um, mental health awareness and awareness for Crohn's disease, we felt like in one in eight couples go through infertility, um, whether it's, you know, female factor, male factor, both or like us, ours was unexplained. No tests gave us any information why we weren't able to conceive naturally. But um, infertility is no one's fault. And it is a really normal experience. And as you mentioned, by the number of books and stories and celebrities, um, it is happening. And I love that the conversation is becoming more real about it. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, from the time like that we got, we were successfully got pregnant after fertility treatment, um, you know, people wanted to know every, every minute, like how I was, how the baby was, how they were growing, how she's growing, et cetera. Um, but once I had the baby, once I had Brooklyn, um, no one asked about me. Like I was literally just persona non grata in the picture. Like people would call us and ask how the baby was or how she was sleeping, how she was eating. But like no one asked how I was, how I was feeling, what I was doing, how my recovery was from delivery, what was hard for me. Um, and I was so surprised that like I thought we were so prepared to become parents and there were so many things about that time as new parents that we didn't know we didn't know until it was 3 a.m. and we were learning it. And so really that, a lot of that motivated my work to get trained and, and start working um, with families that are in the same place to normalize the conversation around all of these pieces of the puzzle 
um, and provide sort of in-person or virtual support or a plan um, for, for new parents to take care of themselves while they transition into their new roles. That is a perfect encapsulation. Oh, there's, there's. That, so that um, was Brooklyn back in October. So she was four months old and um, there are 148 needles in that picture. Those are all of the injections that I, it took for me to get pregnant. And that, that was our- you know. It's such a powerful, powerful series of photos. I mean, I love, I love your social media coverage. And I was just looking back cause I, you know, it's actually on your wall right there. I have, I have Brooklyn right here, her, her arrival it. announcement. Uh, it. And, you know, thank you so much guys for, for sharing this because, you know, one of the hardest parts about stigma is exactly what you've nailed right on the head. Oh, there's the, that's there you go. our <laughs> daughter at four months old modeling the hope for the day onesie. Um, God, that's, so we're just, I'm just going to stop talking for a second. We're just going to take a moment to appreciate that. Um, the best way to distill it down is that when we talk about stigma impact and everything, it's ultimately it comes down to the things that we don't say right. and where they don't come in. When I was mentioning gender, ethnicity, economics, ge geography, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Here you are. Um, and talking about one, thank you for enhancing my language and our audience's language, uh, because I was passively saying postpartum as an inference of depression or whatnot, but understanding right. that it's actually more of a term, a sequence as part of the natural process. Yeah. Uh, that's just as critical using responsible language is, is critical. Um, so there's a few different things to sort of unroll here. Uh, no one's fault. You know, one of his first, that was one of the first things that you jumped on. No one's fault. So where did that had to also come from? Where did you see that there could have been people looking for fault? I suppose is the question I want to ask. Well, I did it with myself. I mean, I think when we, you know, I, I don't know if any, you know, anyone who's listening has um, been, has tried to conceive, but when you desperately want to be pregnant and um, each month you take, you know, negative pregnancy test after negative pregnancy test. And um, yeah, I just, I was feeling broken. I was feeling um, really low. Um, and I felt like, well, if I'm not getting pregnant, there must be something wrong with my body. It must be my fault that we're not getting pregnant. I didn't even think honestly that like it could have been Rick's fault, fault or that it could have been due to something, you know, with Rick's anatomy or anything. Um, and for us, honestly, we went through um, a lot of testing before we started fertility treatments. And like I said, we were diagnosed with unexplained infertility. So one in eight couples experience infertility, current, that's the current stats, and about 10% of those couples experience unexplained infertility, which means there's no scientific or medical reason why we hadn't conceived naturally. Um, that sort of, I think that was like a relief to me um that it was like not something biological on either of our behalfs but I also think a lot of that um, mentality and that language was things that I worked through with my own depression and anxiety um learning to sort of accept that it wasn't my fault that I struggled with my mental health that it wasn't my fault I had dealt with depression and anxiety it wasn't my fault that I have an autoimmune disease um, it wasn't my fault that I was in and out of the hospital for a long time because of my autoimmune disease so I think a lot of it was experience, but I think it's so easy, especially in a society where um, we find that, you know, with something as stigmatized as infertility, um, couples tend to keep their feelings behind closed doors. And, you know, sometimes the, um, the partner who's trying to get pregnant sometimes has family or friends that she can talk to. But a lot of times the partner who's not trying to get pregnant, like doesn't have anyone to talk to. And so um, you know, just realizing that the conversations that we were having behind closed doors were really helping the two of us grow and our marriage grow and that, um, you know, it, in order to be on the same page and be successful as parents, whenever that opportunity was given to us, um, we had to sort of recognize that this was no fault. It was just the situation that we were experiencing and that we had to adjust, you know, our plans and, and work with it as best as we could. And it, it's definitely a roller coaster because when we started down this path, it was something where I, Amanda, when she just said, as far as the different partners there, it was something that 
looking back, we made it paramount to attend each other's uh, appointments for as, as far as in relation to infertility specialists, both male and female, as far as going to the urologist and then going to the endo, or reproductive endocrinologist and, and just back and forth. And just knowing that as important as the language is and the common language is that we could talk to each other's providers the same way we could talk to our own providers. Um, and I know not everybody has that uh, ability and flexibility and, and some of that. So we understand the, the privilege that we have to be able to, to dictate some of our own, our own healthcare in that. But with that, it was, that was our effort in breaking down that stigma to be able to say, we're in this together between the two of us. We're hoping for a common re result. Like we've both been putting in the work. Uh, we've both, you know, turned sex into a scheduled thing for, for lack of a, a better yeah. term and anything else. Um, but it, it ends up being something where, you know, we're putting in that work to figure out what's going on to see how we can conceive and it's not working. So we both need to be on the same page as opposed to being something like the, the typical uh, or stereotypical facets of like, oh, well, I'm doing my part. It's something you go figure it out type thing. So we always made sure to have that conversation between us and understand that before and after every appointment, we were good with where we were going, the next steps we were taking, going from just the initial testing into some of the IUI treatments, which is kind of the first uh, foray into infertility uh, treatments. And then once we moved into IVF to see what we had to do there and, and process some of that. See, and that's something that in you walking through the dynamics of your communication and, and the mutual shared responding, when and hopefully we talk about the way, the best way you can be supportive to someone, you're a very different level of this. But when we talk about think of yourselves as teammates, um, that might register as a platonic relationship for a lot of people. But when we talk about that concept of teammate, we mean eye to eye and not one above the other um, and not looking for blame, but looking how do we solve solutions together? Because if you want to be supportive for someone's mental health, the best thing you can be you know, is as the non-clinician part is to be that teammate thing. And your demonstration and illustration of that, you know, in the way it looks for you two is, is such a beautiful thing. Um, one of the things that we always want to talk about with stigma and breaking through stigma and, and, and that is about the openness and the outreach. And so you touched on the sort of family feeling a little squirmish. So I think you know, we can be here for two hours and more unpacking the sort of like puritanical like hesitancies around talking about everything in the reproductive world. But what I would like to talk about is the idea that these are people who know you two and how they would trust and trust in who you are as human beings, you're confident human beings, and they can still give people pause. And what I want to, what was your thought process? I want to I'm going to ask you about how you responded. How did you, you're not going to just say like, go to hell. How do you bring people in on this? Because for a lot of folks who are maybe debating or trying to navigate, how do they share their experiences? How do they do it without being combative and not taking it personally when people are like, well, what, ooh, you know, mm, 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 you know, so I don't know. What was that, what was that process like for you two? So um, I think that's a really good question. And like you said, I think there are a lot of layers of the answer. Um, but at the most rudimentary level, um, you know, Rick and I had both done a lot of mental health advocacy and I've done a lot of physical health advocacy with my Crohn's disease um, and what it's like to live with, you know, a disability or what, however you categorize chronic illness. But um, we decided that we wanted to share it in a way that in 10, 15, 20 years, um, our child or children could see the things that we shared and the way we spoke about our journey and be proud that they were so wanted that we, you know, went through all this really hard stuff to get to them. And so um, we just, we trusted our instincts, Rick and I, and the voices that we had used up until that point on other topics. And we decided that we were going to share um, only in a way that we were comfortable with. And that is going to look different for every couple. Um, what we said to our families is that we understood um, their hesitation and, and why they felt like maybe this was more of a private thing in, in the past or for them, um, but that we were sharing our 
journey and our experiences to normalize the conversation. And we hope that they'd eventually, you know, support that initiative that we were taking. And uh, I'll tell you honestly, um, for anyone who is pregnant or has a child, um, that insight, I'll call it, from other people, um, it never stops. Uh, everyone has insight on um, how to parent and what that looks like. And um, part of it is just kind of saying, thank you, I really appreciate it. And we will do uh, what we feel is right for our family. So um, a lot of it was kind of sticking to our guns and just being patient with uh, the people who maybe were concerned or non-understanding. I mean, I'll steal slash borrow Marlo's quote here. And like, we were already doing a lot of screaming between ourselves and with the folks in the circle that we were we were do, doing and walking this journey with. So it only made sense to kind of share it so that the other people that we knew felt like they couldn't share or that they were struggling maybe in silence, that it was easier for them to, to do that so that they could start to breathe, so that they could start to whisper and then they could start to figure some of that out. I mean, as far as sharing things and, not being combative, but in, in a way that makes it productive. I mean, I went from a IUI appointment where I gave a sperm sample directly to the Humboldt Mile. And so I went straight from Northwestern Hospital, drove to Humboldt Park, and then ran a one mile race that I got outrun by a man in a T-Rex costume. So like, there's nothing more awkward than for me than is giving a sperm sample than walking down the hall and having to fill out some uh, paperwork where I, you know, have to fill out things in triplicate and all of this stuff, make sure I hand them my license and things because that's completely natural. Um, so it's like that I'm already over the hump of awkwardness and anything like it's done. It's what what good is, you know, not talking about it going to do. Um, and so like all of those steps in sequence, just kind of everything made sense. Everything kept going. And I mean, there were parts where it definitely like there was hesitation for us just because like we didn't know what we were getting into as far as the medical aspects and some of what we would need to do and how much, uh, as you saw with uh, some of the pictures we had, like all of the, the medical equipment we had at the house with all of the needles and everything we needed to do and, and handle. Um, and so it was it was something that that was the way to not let it build up inside of us where we knew we were going through, we knew kind of the next step, we knew what the next right step was because this was for us. We knew what our next doctor's appointment was. We knew what the kind of what to expect and, and kind of went through it. So it was it was something that we, it was for us as much as it was for us to help other people to be able to say, this is what we're going through. This is what we're, we're kind of walking through. You may find yourself in a similar position and it's okay however you're feeling in that position. Man, and I gotta tell you, you know, I had an involuntary tear just like jump out on me when you were talking about like uh, how you're sharing the message and that your child, you know, uh, we'll see how much they were wanted. <laughs> I don't know, that's a really beautiful thing. But collectively, thank you for, for, for drawing this message home for folks. Um, and yeah, you know, Marlo, I guess you, you knocked it on the park. I mean, you had already had the advocacy level, but I think this is the perfect way of sort of consolidating the whole episode is that it comes in different scales, but people seeing your truth, Amanda and Rick, people seeing your truth and your journey, I know as a fact that I referenced your guys' social media platform to, to a friend who themselves was, um, an individual who was going through this process and they were doing it as going to be a, a willing single parent and uh, they had doubts and, and their network obviously is gonna look a little different, but you know, visibility. When we talk about raising the visibility, gosh darn it, like, yeah, there does need to be shouters out there and for other folks, you know, the person I'm, I'm referencing is not likely to start a social media account or do anything like that. And what we'll call the whispers, really just the visibility. They're going to go through what their network with their, their support group and they're going to do what they got to do. Um, but you all are such inspiring human beings because taking that first step out is terrifying. And there are way too many people, especially in the world of, of, of child rearing, okay? Like there's too many people who are, are for and getting 
the bad information because there's an absence of, of real truth out there. And I just think that that's such an important part of, of, of this whole compendium is that your connection with the mental health level, there's way too many people who are thinking it's their fault. Mm-hmm. You know, and I do want to go back into, please, for our audience, um, what I mispronounced or miscategorized this postpartum, that whole collective series of, of people having mental health challenges after birth, in the, in the postpartum phase of the birthing process is called? Perinatal mood and anxiety disorders or PMAD. Okay, perfect. Because there's too many people <laughs> experiencing things like that where they don't recognize that there's a, there's an actual mental health situation for it. And so and well, before to, to jump into anything, why don't you give the time frame on some of that too? Because that's also an unknown. Yeah, absolutely. So um, women can experience any type of additional mood and anxiety challenges during pregnancy. That's called antenatal mood and anxiety disorders. And then any time from the day that you give birth until 12 months, when your child turns a year old, any time in those 12 months, it is completely normal that the hormone changes in motherhood can impact your mental health, can raise underlying issues that haven't been, you know, that you haven't really seen before, but um, postpartum depression, postpartum anxiety, postpartum psychosis, postpartum OCD, they're all real things and they can happen anytime within that first year after you have a baby. So even if you're six, seven, eight months out and you notice that things are changing for you, that things don't feel as good as they did, talk to someone, talk to your partner, talk to your doctor. It is so important. And the the sooner that you address it, the sooner that you take those steps to, to get help for that, the sooner you're going to feel better. Oh, that's just, that's the perfect kind of content we love. Um, and I wanted to, to touch on one more thing before we sort of go into our sort of closing sequence here is, um, Rick, you, you were touching on sort of from your experience level and I would be remiss to, to sort of talk about, well, there's the conception thing and, and it is rightfully so, you know, focused on, on, on the mother. Did you ever find, it doesn't sound like you personally, but did you ever come across anyone who, who you saw a mental health thing or sort of a, a, a response that was from the, from the sort of masculine link, sort of part of the conversation, right? So I will let Rick into this, but I wanted to add that postpartum anxiety and depression is also possible. It does also happen in the non-birthing parent. So for dads, for the non-birthing parent, it is still possible that the circumstances triggered by having a new baby can impact and you can get, you know, Rick could have gotten postpartum depression or postpartum anxiety. So for the non-birthing partner, it's also really important to know that your mental health can be affected and that it's okay. It's not anything that you did wrong. Um, it's not, it's, it's literally a combination of circumstances. So I just wanted to add that and then you can speak to that. So there wasn't anything that I encountered directly from as far as the conception or going through the, the journey through some of it, but a lot of it was noticing during the postpartum period from the fatherhood perspective, kind of, again, like Amanda said, a lot of it turns to the the child immediately, uh, a lot of it rightfully so, but then there's still, you know, there's still parents there that need to be taken care of. Um, so I was lucky enough and uh, grateful enough to have paid uh, paternal leave. So during that time, that was something that uh, I had a roller coaster of emotions for that and through that and every day and just Brooklyn surprised us a, a full four weeks early. So we weren't necessarily uh, ready for that. Um, I mean, a little Easter egg here is we were do, we were at a conversations cafe planning meeting in the very office you're sitting in, Carl, when Amanda called me and said her water broke. Um, so that was something, that, you know, 12 hours later, she was here. So that, that wasn't anything we were prepared for. So the, the notion of dealing with some of that while we were still kind of settling into our new place um, and figuring that out was something that was very difficult. And even just the new parenting and then the anxiety that comes with a, a uh, premature baby. Uh, and then she luckily only had to spend one night in the NICU towards the end of her hospital stay, but it was still all good. But then even just getting her home and all that stuff. So there's a lot of built-in anxiety on the, the front end of that. Um, and coming off of paternity leave and figuring out uh, a way back in as opposed to, and I, I know that there's a lot of dads that have to jump right back into work or the, the non-birthing parent that have to jump right back into work. Uh, and the 
since you said we could cuss at the beginning, I, I'm going to use this term now, it, it ends up being a big mind fuck because you, you want to be there for your child, but you know you also have to provide. You want to be there for your partner, but you also know you have to provide. And it really is something where it's a self-isolating uh, thing because you don't know how to get to work your way out of it because it just feels like you have to keep doubling up to catch up. Um, and so that's where, again, just talking about it comes into play so much because if, if we weren't talking about it, like we would have blown up or, or something would have happened where there were you know, many nights where tears were shed from both of us, where we learned the hard way not to try new things when we were trying to get Brooklyn to sleep at night and things like that. Um, and so, so there's, there's a lot there that, uh, you know, it was going into it. It felt like, you know, we were coming at it as a team, but, you know, walking through it, we had to be one unit or else it wasn't going to, it wasn't going to make it out the other side. So looking back, I mean, there's a lot, um, that is done for the postpartum period with, with moms and the birthing parent. Uh, but there seems to be, you have to dig harder. You have to find harder, um, for either like dad's groups or the non-birthing parent and some, some of that support. Um, so it ends up, it, it's been something I've paid attention to, uh, as far as going back. And, and I don't know if it is just a symptom of the, the other parent going back to work so, so soon after and kind of expecting that to be the bulk of their time or whatever. Um, and it was a juggling act for me too, as far as coming back into it and understanding, uh, returning to work, understanding, producing, hosting, and uh, recording a podcast, uh, and, and then just free time. And then what that meant for time for Amanda and I, time for all of the three of us, time for me in Brooklyn. Um, and so it, it was a rough ride to kind of establish something and then let alone not even getting into the current uh, realm of things that, that we're going through today. Um, but since, uh, I mean, we started off with, with Marlo's quote, I, there's one quote that I, I heard last week that, um, rings true now. And then even it's kind of something I've been focusing on for, uh, our parenting journey. Um, and it's from an episode of Batwoman from uh, a couple weeks ago. Uh, but it's one of the characters is telling Batwoman's alter ego, al alter ego. Uh, I don't need you to be a hero. I just need you to keep going. And so that is generally what I've found to be my motto and, and kind of it uh, coalesced everything that I've been feeling of some of the blogging I've been doing over on Anthologies of Hope. Um, and it was, it's really kind of, you know, crystallized everything for me. Um, and that is what I think our message is as a parenting team is there's so much each of us needs to do, but then there's also this implicit feeling that each one of us has to be a, a hero in our own right where we don't need to be that hero. We just need to keep going together and, and then we'll get through it. So, and I want to just add something, Rick made a really good point is that, you know, Rick and I had been the other five years before we became parents and we have thought we had a great, you know, we did, we had a great foundation, great communication, but we had to relearn how to communicate as parents. Um, communication is different when you are four months in this complete and total sleep deprivation when everything that you do say and breathe is about another human being who completely relies on you. And so um, I always tell my clients and, and you know new parents in general that your communication with your partner, with your family, with your parents, with your friends, it is different once there's a baby and that is okay. And there is space and grace for that. It's normal. It's normal for everything to change. Just, if the mics could be on fire, it's a little hot fire. It could be your hero, baby. Bam, 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 I get, bam. I, I get, you know, another, you know, of the of the great stuff that's coming out here, I'm glad that this is recorded, um, is also highlighting this non-birthing parent is such a beautiful way of keeping in context the, the diversity of what a family means nowadays. You know, uh, Two parents can share the same gender identity. Two parents could be fluid. So saying Zimaza and Zifaza is probably outdated. And, you know, uh, a little nugget for, for those who care, like the biggest thing or most consistent thing you could ever learn in all of human history is that it's the constant discovery and rediscovery of our own limitations. And non birth parent is me discovering a far more advanced way of discussing and, 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 and talking about this than using the old the old nuclear structure. A lot of the things that you mentioned, and also it seems like, you know, relearning communication, 
I hope everyone wrote that down in your mind or literally wrote it down. Um, not to be the hero, but to keep going. Um, but I find it interesting that a lot of this also cycles around something that is both true for the individual and probably has to be true for the parents. When you're talking about once the baby is out, what about you? Is it's self-care and maybe it's parental self-care. But I kind of want to sort of go, go, go home on that and just sort of, because it's so hard for everyone in every space and realm of wherever they are in their life, whether you're 12 or 90 years old, I, you know, what have you learned about being able to find the space? You know, you, you know, Rick and, and many of you both said like time for Rick, Amanda, Brooklyn, Rick and Amanda, Rick and Rick, Amanda, Amanda. Um, what have you learned? And maybe if you got a nugget in there about, you know, your own self-care, what sort of some things you really found are important to, to, to make it happen, if at all. <laughs> Yeah. So, um, I guess, so in light of like the way that life currently is operating, um, one thing that I have learned about my mental health as a person and as a mother and as a wife is that I need to go outside. I need to get outside every single day and breathe fresh air. Even if it's for five minutes, that has been a huge thing for me. But a lot of this has been learning because some of the things I did for self-care, some of the things that we did for self-care before Brooklyn don't exist anymore. Um, for the sheer factor of time, limitations, babysitter, cost, uh, energy levels, et cetera. Um, so I think that you have, to, uh, my advice would be to be open about evolving what your self-care looks like. Honestly, in the first couple of months as parents, self-care was being able to take a shower without like listening for the baby's crying. Like if the other parent had the baby, being able to take like an actual shower and be mindful that you were showering, that was self-care. Um, you know, sometimes it was sitting down and eating the meal while it was still hot instead of after the baby was fed and after she was put in bed or whatever. Um, things that we really didn't think twice about before we became parents um, became huge parts of self-care as parents. So I think um, my advice would be be open to your self-care definition evolving and um, be graceful with yourself in finding uh, ways to take care of your mind and your body that maybe look different than they used to. And for me, I mean, prior to Brooklyn, I was going to the gym four or five days a week and it was a pretty regular regimen and a physical activity, a component of that was getting outside, but a lot of it is just the physical activity, uh, lifting weights, uh, cross training, some of that stuff that, that always kept me uh, grounded and, and reduced a lot of my stressors, but it's just not something that I have the capacity for now just for a schedule. Um, I'm also not one to do a lot of home workouts, which is even more of a twist now through uh, a lot of the, the social distancing practices and limitations that we have. Um, so a lot of it was relearning to give myself grace for what I could do, what I couldn't do, um, things that I could uh, appropriately, appropriately readjust for some of that. Um, for like, I'm still working full time. I work remote. Uh, I work a normal 40 hour 40 plus hour work week uh, remotely. Um, and so I'm work, working from home and even more, more so now. So it's a matter of figuring out what that day looks like with everybody still in the house um, and figuring that out. So like, I mean, I figured out that it works well to, I get up with Brooklyn in the morning and I spend a couple of hours with her before needing to uh, go to work and head downstairs and sign on and all that stuff. So it's usually in the morning, it's uh, daddy daughter time. And that's when we'll get up, we'll give her her bottle and we play and uh, she enjoys the WGN morning news and all of that stuff with me. And so just knowing that's the, the schedule that we have. And then, you, you know, as far as personal time, like shifting some of that, what does it mean? Um, whereas before, you know, lifting weights and doing some things and figuring out like pushing 300 pounds for deadlifts used to be what I was striving for. Now it ends up being something where I can just go on and watch any episode of psych ever and that resets me, it empties all my stressors and I'm perfectly happy and can go do whatever I need to now. So it's just kind of readjusting and knowing that there are gonna be changes in your self care and you can't beat yourself up because what was working for you before either it is not working or it just, it's not working for you right now. So just trying to readjust that and make sure that you, that is a fluid exercise as opposed to something that you're kind of pressing on yourself because it's not, what you thought it would be. Mm -mm. That 
it's just delicious. Delicious for the mind and soul. And you know, I think this is a perfect place for, for us to sort of touch down because I feel like we've been floating up into the into the upper tropospheres with your insights from all of our guests today. Um, and I kind of I kind of uh, threw out the format sheet here. Um, we were gonna do a little bit of a group powwow things, but I think that we've really hit on a thing uh, a good spot. And so the way I'm gonna sort of reformat our ending is we like to close out with always trying to put a positive foot forward, not BS empty statements or vaporware, but in order to be resilient and, and to, to go forward, it sometimes helps to create a positive context. And if we can look for that sort of sunny spot, um, that's a good way to, to do things. And I've been asking folks in our episodes that, you know, right now, and I'm a broken record on this part, right now we are on a new frontier. We are in a Star Trek moment and we are all our own Kirks or Cisco's or Picard's or Janeway's or, and I don't ever remember Scott Bakula's captain's name, <laughs> but uh, thems um, or Solos or, or any of the other captains out there. But so there was an old normal and we're now looking at a new normal, whatever and whatever we go forward. And this is an opportunity for us to look at what do we want to bring into that new normal? Um, and so I'd like to end this episode by hearing from all of our wonderful guests on what constitutes our, our new normal. And um, since you've been so patient with us uh, for tagging in, uh, let's start with our agents of impact first. Um, Hillary, what would you hope might be your new normal? Um, taking time to get outside, uh, echoing what Amanda was saying, I've really, that's kind of been the saving grace in this whole thing. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Hillary. Um, and so, Marlo, what would be your uh, new normal? Um, I think being kinder with myself and with the people around me, just kind of like understanding that we don't have to be at a certain place like everybody else and it's good to just be kind to ourselves and understand that we're living under very stressful circumstances and it's okay to have bad days it's okay to not be the most productive person out there that's a big one awesome thank you very much aaron and mike what do you think i think that we've i think we've come up with a pretty good schedule that we sort of follow every day like we'll make like lunch together and then go walk the dog um and that's that's really like that's nice we've been doing that we kind of did that happen well i mean it was it was forced upon us really because i get to i i have the the good fortune of being able to work full time from home and uh and due to the realities of covid um you know she's she's at home and just trying to figure out what to do each day. And so making that, establishing that routine together, um, it's nice. Cause like, I'll be like, I need a break from looking at a damn screen. Let's I'm going to, I'm going to make some food with you or we're going to go for a walk or we're going to put a puzzle together or something like that. And so. since he's so busy with work, I would definitely echo what Marlo said about just being kind to myself. Like, just just trying to do that as much as possible but not put too many expectations on myself because of what other people are doing or saying you know high five me <laughs> and and along those lines i need to roll it back a little bit like whatever comes next um maybe maybe i need to continue to bring forward with me this this deliberate making of time to cook for myself and uh you know, close a laptop at five uh, most days and stuff like that. Instead of really just feeling like I got to do everything uh, in one day, because um, I, I I'm prone to that. <laughs> I do. Thank you very much. And uh, Amanda and Rick. Um. So I used to like define myself by like the phrase, "If you feel too much, like I always have feel like I have felt too much." Um, and something that I've come to be able to articulate during this time is that um, there's space for grief and gratitude. 
Um, and that's something that I have been working really hard to honor is that um, I tend to get really down on myself when I feel upset or when I feel frustrated, um, you know, that I know that things could be way worse or way harder and I should just be grateful. And so um, something that I want, I hope that I allow myself to continue doing is, is honoring both the grief and the gratitude and, uh, you know, life is heavy and light. And so knowing that they both sit beside each other um, and that there's space for both of them is something, a service that I could do to myself. Love that. Uh, for me, I mean, I'm going to bring it back to Marlo's quote as well as some of what Mike said, but I'll, I'll be doubling down on the fact that to do this as a team, we are in this together. Um, so we need to leverage each other because it takes a lot of energy to do all that screaming. And so, you know, no, not everybody has a lot of energy right now. Um, so needing to understand what can be done in a single day, knowing what can be done, uh, knowing how you can empower others to do what you traditionally would have done on your own in the past. Um, a lot of the, the hope of the day team that we have now, they're absolutely kicking ass on everything they're doing in the, the virtual space. Um, whereas before that would be something that, you know, that's what I've done mostly for the, the 15 years of my career, but I don't have the, the space, the time and, or the brain capacity to do those on top of each other right now. So knowing, and just kind of figuring out where I can help support folks, um, I'm in a similar place right now with Anthologies of Hope that Marlo mentioned with, with her podcast. A lot of the folks that we were going to have on that we had planned, you know, both myself and the guests are taking a lot of energy to make sure they're safe at home, take care of their family. And you don't have the energy to go through those long form conversations right now where, you know, in six months time, maybe we can revisit those, but it's kind of like understanding what you just need to get through today. And then what you can do to help others and not have to, you know, help everybody all at once, all at the same time. That's, that is a tremendous way to wrap up. And on that note, you're going to notice as we close out, we've got some fun little videos for you to watch once I'm done jabbering, including Aaron Dunbar's very successful creations in Animal Crossing. And I'll just close out um, this episode with, with three things. One, when Amanda and Rick were talking about it uh, earlier and some of the last things they said, it really stuck out with me is giving yourself grace. And, uh, and this ties back in for Marlo, this ties back in with Hillary, this ties back in with Aaron and Mike. And that's where I want to sort of summarize up with this episode is that a lot of our mental health dual diagnosis in and of itself is probably an outmoded word mental health intersects with every part of our lives. And again, if it impacts your quality of life, it impacts your mental health. That's the reality. And whether your experiences and challenges are tangible and physiological, or they're something from an experience you're having with the external world, we can't silence ourselves. Um, and not all of us are gonna be the screamers and shouters on the mountaintops, but Giving grace to yourself also means even if you need to start a conversation for yourself through a whisper, the thing we want you to remember is that it's okay not to be okay. And when you have this idea that, and again, I'm gonna steal another one from Amanda, about the time there's a place for grief and gratitude, your experiences don't have to look like someone else's. If you feel you've got something that you need to talk about People say, well, look at others around you who have it so much worse. That's invalidating your personal experience. That's not respecting the dignity of your individual self. Just because other people are going through things that appear to be visibly more intensive than what you're going through does not change the fact that what you're going through is impacting you and you have a right and deserve to, to seek out treatments and supports to correct it or improve your quality of life. And that's what giving grace can be. Aside from just self-care and, and making time for yourself, it can also be creating the space for you to start a conversation. And if you're interested in supporting others or advocating for others to start conversations, you want to be a shouter or a screamer. You want to be someone like Marlo, like Hillary, like Mike, Aaron, Rick, and Amanda. Please stay connected with Hope for the Day and reach out through our volunteer uh, resources, through Agents of Impact. Because... When we say we're all in this together, that doesn't mean we're all coming from the same intersections. Have you seen from our amazing guests tonight, 
we are coming from a diverse spectrum of backgrounds and our lived experience is no more or no less than one of the others. And as we close out tonight, I wanna to thank our guests for sharing their experiences and for using their voices and being agents of impact in all their wonderful, glorious ways. Marla Reyes, Hilary Kinnis, Mike Van Opel, Aaron Dunbar, Amanda and Rick Osowski, thank you all for your time and your energies and voices. You are all incredible, beautiful people. We've had pets make cameos as well. Hello. And so <laughs> if you got a pet on your hand, <laughs> get it up in the air. So as we sign off tonight, please stick around and watch the remaining videos. This has been Conversations Cafe. I'm Carl Evans and have a wonderful night. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Real quick, I just want to share with everybody, um, Heartfelt Beginnings on Instagram um, is where you can follow Amanda. Um, she is, as you know now, just such a wonderful, wonderful voice on this topic and uh, breaking stigma surrounding IVF, uh, all sorts of things relating to postpartum mental health and uh, just advocating for the moms out there, the dads out there, the family people out there in that non-nuclear sense. Um, so check her out. And uh, here, here you go. Um, and with the critters, we want to really quick uh, share with you something that's super cool, super special. Um, Aaron has been really utilizing her time to um, develop a really cool little little community on Hope <laughs> Island and Animal Crossing. If you want to go visit Hope Island, this is Erin and her avatar in her town square with the special Have Hope flag she engineered the other day. Um, and then this is her looking really happy about it. Um, ultimately, you could imagine that this is a sip of hope in Animal Crossing on Hope Island. And then uh, last night, um, we created an It's Okay Not to Be Okay painting to greet you as you get off the dock if you arrive by boat or plane to Hope Island. And uh, also made some fresh Hope shirts. <laughs> so that's cool. Um, but yeah, this has been like such a cool family affair. Um, I, can't, I can't even begin to express my gratitude for all the guests this evening and and my man, Carl, uh, the consummate host. Anthologies of Hope is also just a wonderful spot to um, continue to this conversation for yourself. It takes a little bit of practice to really understand and uh, shape how you respond to mental health in your own kind of way. So um, be gentle with yourself, as we said before, and make sure that you take the opportunities that we've provided for you to uh, check out the archive Conversations Cafe at Anthologies of Hope, um, also at our YouTube channel. And ultimately uh, come see me for some education every Tuesday at 11 a.m. Central Standard Time. We're doing it in the Zoom room every Saturday at 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time. Things we don't say, um, I would really love to help empower you in this conversation for yourselves and the people you care about the most, your friends, your family, your coworkers. Because if we press this conversation in our sphere of influence, we can save lives. We can make it okay to talk about mental health. We can eliminate and dispel stigma surrounding it. And people can get the help they need prior to the crisis stage. So um, in, in uh, reminding, everybody that we're celebrating Sip of Hope's second anniversary, please go to savesip.org uh, to help us raise money to make sure that Sip of Hope exists long into the future. And uh, we're going to leave you with this, this uh, walk down memory lane, uh, the Sip of Hope grand opening video. It's four and a half minutes of just beautiful, beautiful stuff. So I hope you enjoy it, and I hope it gives you a little smile and, and a little extra hope. Thanks for tuning in tonight. Suicide is a crisis in this country. 121 people kill themselves 
each and every day. Now, a Chicago nonprofit has the goal to drop that May number is below 100. Part of the strategy is highlighting involves a coffee, coffee shop with a cause. Sip of Hope is described as the first coffee shop in the world where 100% of the net proceeds will fund proactive suicide prevention. And it will coffee shop that uh, just opened in Logan Square has an inspiring mission. Kristen Nicole has that story. You know, a lot of people start their mornings with a cup of joe, so why not do it at a place where all of the... Logan Square's new Sip of Hope coffee shop, Caffeine Flows with Purpose, offering mental illness education for suicide prevention. Silence is winning. And the more that we talk about it, the more that we'll realize that we're not alone, we're not crazy, we're not insane, we are human beings, and we're going through a thing called life. Yeah, right. 